Have you heard about ChatGPT? What is it and how can it help you in general practice? In this episode, I'm going to be exploring all those things and a little bit more and how this new model can really help you in general practice. And we're going to be talking to one of our experts that's going to help us understand that, Dr. Keith Grimes. Yep, I know you all know him. And he's going to be helping us understand this new thing that we think is going to be game changing for general practice. Let's tech enhance your primary care and learning. Hello, EGP learners, and welcome to this session where we've got Dr. Keith Grimes joining us. I'm so happy. It's been ages since I've had a chance to have a proper chat with him. Definitely. And we're going to be having a look at some really cool new stuff that's, well, we say new, it's probably been around for a little bit longer than we think, but actually in terms of how you can use it in general practice, wow. Some of the stuff I know Keith's been talking about has been absolutely stunning. But just before we get to that, Keith, for those that don't actually know who you are, which I don't know how that's possible, but you know, tell us who you are and what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, great. Good morning, everyone, and uh, Merry Christmas uh, to everyone that's there. My name is Keith Grimes. I am a GP. Uh, in terms of my general practice background, I've been a GP since 2000. I trained up in Edinburgh. And uh, in terms of my clinical work, I've been really involved in urgent and unscheduled care, ran a few practices and ran a walk-in center. And stepped away from that back in 2018 because um, I've always been really passionate about technology and healthcare. And back in 2018, after doing some of it within the NHS, I joined a company called Babylon uh, as a director of clinical innovation and uh, have spent the last four and a half years working there up until very recently, um, working on things like their symptom checker, managing the internal clinical subject matter expert group, and then latterly in clinical product management and AI services. So it's been an absolute whirlwind. It's been brilliant fun. Uh, but as things changed, I decided recently, really very recently, back on the 9th of December, um, stepped out to find the next thing that's happening, get dug into some of the new challenges. So I go by a digital health and a clinical product management consultant now. Um, I love hearing people's healthcare problems and helping them solve them. That's my real passion now. And it's brilliant to speak to you this morning and uh, talk about one of the things that I've been really excited about, uh, which is the arrival of what are called large language models, which we'll tell you all about today. But, but Gandhi, you're actually, it is very recent. What I'm talking about today basically only became accessible on the 30th of November. So, uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's very recent. There's been a lot of work beforehand, but yeah, it's all new, which is why it's exciting. Okay. So uh, as many people know, I love my tech and I love tech in general practice. Um, but I must admit when it came to this particular thing, I had to go to someone that knows it definitely better than I do. And, and, I, and the only person I could think of was you, Keith. But um, I know we're talking about this thing called chat GPT. What is it? <laughs> All right, well, I'll do my best to explain it as well. And whilst I spend a lot of time working with the technology, there are people that are much better versed to go into the details. So I'm going to ask for forbearance for all the AI people and data scientists out there who start pulling their hair out when I start mashing some of the description. <laughs> uh, but we'll do what we can here. Okay, so first of all, what does chat GPT stand for? So chat GPT is a chat generative pre-trained transformer. GPT is a generative pre-trained transformer. And you'll be like, well, what on earth is a GPT? What is that? Well, it describes it's not some of the tech prime then. Hmm? Not, so no, no, although, although I will come on to some interesting transformer related stuff later on. Um, yes, so it's um, what's called a large language model. And a large language model is a particular type of model that's built on the principles of neural networks. Now, We'll go from the bottom up quite simply. Hopefully you might know what a neural network is, but if you don't, don't worry. If you've got a medical background, a neural network's been around for a while. It's basically a, a mathematical and software approach. It's inspired by nature um, to create a kind of mechanism by which you have like essentially neurons, essentially digital neurons, and they will mm -hmm. take inputs and they will process data by passing it across these neurons to an output. So you get data in, processed, data out. It's using principles that are the same within the human body and, and, and biology. So that's the neural net. The large language models are a particular type of those that are space that are trained to take text input and produce text output as well. So what might they be used for? Well, for a start, if you've used Google at all and you've used language translation, that will be a large language model. It can help classify text. It can identify what different text means. It can work out what the sentiment of the content of text might be, help with comprehension of reading, answer questions and answers, and even generate um, copy, like uh, news articles, tweets, interviews, and so on. Okay. So they're pretty capable uh, things. They've been around for a little while, but it's 
but it's what's been very, very interesting recently is that they've they all the mathematical and sort of technological advances means they can build ever, ever bigger models and ever, ever bigger data to train it. And that's where we come to with things like GPT. OK, so it can basically take data, process it and output it in a different way is the absolute basic part of it. Yeah. And what we're going to hopefully show you is how that can be relevant in general practice, particularly with a view of saving you time, which uh, as many of the EGP learners know, that's what we love to try and help you do. Mm -hmm. but a good place to start is how on earth do you start using it? <laughs> Probably yeah. a good place. I sure. know it's just the yeah, sure. So um, maybe what we can do is I can see if I can present my screen as well. And before we go onto that as well, so these the, these models, um, um, uh, absolutely huge. Some of the interesting facts is like, what, what data is it trained on? Well, some of these new models are literally trained on the internet. They're trained on the whole corpus of text that's on the internet. And these models, basically, if you get, if you want a really simplified version of what they do, they predict what text comes next. They do a really, really good impression of what's on the internet. But when you're dealing with billions and billions of neurons, it's like petabytes of data that impression can get very very good so let's go across and see how you get in because actually there's nothing more like actually seeing it work to really get your head around it so let me just give this a try uh let me share screen and i should take you here and i'm just going to check can you see uh yeah i can see it on the screen right now it says yeah, welcome there we go oh, let's go yeah okay so if you want to go to chat gpt it's just chat.openai.com and when you go to that page, you'll get a login like this. Now, what you need to log in is a Google account. So you can either sign up for a Google account. It's just a way of authorizing here more than anything. But I already have one, so I'm going to click login. And then it welcomes me back, and I can put my password and stuff. Or you can use all the different authentications. I see, actually, you don't need a Google account. You can use different ones as well. Microsoft, unsurprisingly, Microsoft are a big investor in uh, OpenAI. So I'm going to okay. continue with Google. And there's me. That's me in. So um, when you do this for the first time, you'll get a little bit of instruction, uh, just talking through a little bit about what this does. Um, but um, but for me, I've done this before. I've got some previous chats here, on the, which we're going to go through. And it just gives you a little bit of an example here about how you ask questions. And this is what you do. You ask questions. So I'll pause there. And uh, yeah, let's see how we get on. OK, so where would you like to start us with then, Keith? What would be a good question model for us to show what this can really do? Yeah, all right. OK, well, why don't we start with something simple? So what are you? OK, well, just ask what a chat GPT is. Now, what it's doing here, as you read this, is it's taken this information that I've written at the top, it's broken it down into tokens, and then passed it onto a model which is running on a big server somewhere. These are huge language models. They require an enormous amount of computing power. And the understanding is that it's currently costing OpenAI about $4 million US dollars um, a day to run this. So I dare say it will cost money down the line. They have to find a way to pay for it. But here you go. So what are you? I'm an artificial intelligence language model called Assistant trained by OpenAI. Not a real person, but rather a computer program designed to generate human-like text and respond to user input. Now, I'm not going to read the rest. But the important thing for you to see is that this isn't preformed text. This is text that's been generated by the model. So. That's all interesting. But let's say, for example, I want to say this. Well, this is all very nice. And I look in here and I say, assisting and providing information. Are there any limitations on your abilities to provide information? Provide information. And there you go. So what it's saying here is it doesn't have any personal experiences or feelings because, of course, it's a machine. It's an artificial intelligence. Yep. It can't provide physical tasks. Again. It's not been told to say this. It is generating this. It's predicting this as the appropriate response to the question that's been asked here as well. And what's nice about this as well is that it's also recognizing some of its limitations. It's showing transparency because I need to know that this is not a person. This is a machine. Mm -hmm. um, and there you go. So you can read a bit more. So I would encourage everyone to log in and just play around, you know. But I could also say, well, you know, before we get onto some medical ones, like... Uh, uh, can you say this in French? And I'll just translate it. I could ask it to do it as a poem. I could ask it to do it as a song. I could ask it to do it in the voice of Yoda. Um, this is the <laughs> interesting thing. Uh, it can do a great deal of very interesting things in there. But joking aside, I can see this being very valuable 
Now, we'll come on to the limitations of this, but very valuable yeah. if I have a patient who doesn't have English as a first language, who finds medical language difficult, we'll use one of those as an example because it can mm -hmm. simplify things. And also, if patients had access to this, they can then query further and ask it to explain different difficult words as well. So mm -hmm. that's a quick introduction to playing around with it. Okay, so let's have a look at some medical examples, shall we? Because that's probably going to be useful to our viewers out there to understand how this can be used in practice, because actually we think this would be awesome in practice, correct? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Now, the first thing I'm going to say here is that all of these things that I'm going to show you, I am not recommending that you use them in your current practice right now. There are things that need to happen before this is safe and reliable and effective to use there. So please bear that in mind as we put these demos. But what I'm doing is I'm showing you what some future of having this kind of functionality integrated into your service might look like, okay? Mm -hmm. So when people think about AI, one of the things, I often got this as well, is that, oh, AI is there to replace doctors and nurses, you know, it can never mm -hmm. replace us and so on. And I think um, if you park that, as to even if you wanted to do that, that's not an interesting thing. AI is a tool. And the thing that's wonderful about humans is humans are expert tool users and builders. So I get excited about using AI plus humans as a tool and a tool user to do something that is beyond what they could ordinarily do, either beyond their capabilities or scaling it. So always think about it this way. And I as the GP and Gandhi, you as a GP and maybe some of the GPs and doctors watching this, there'll be lots of things that you do that are... Uh, readily done, or sometimes they're complex, but they're kind of bureaucratic and administrative. Mm -hmm. Diagnosis, treatment, everything, that's one thing. But you know, there's a lot of things that we do that just burn our time. And I think this is where large language models like chat GPT, when they're ready for use, will be really helpful. So one of the examples that we had, and this actually came uh, from Ed Turnham. So that's uh, at Ed Turnham on Twitter. Uh, there was a few of us playing around with this. Uh, and he gave a really good example and said, well, um, one of the things that we sometimes have to do is with patients who are on SSRIs or antidepressants is you want to wean them. But it can take a long time to sort of explain what a weaning yep. process might be and how to do this. So he said, well, he put a tweet out and I can repost this later on with a few prompts. And when you ask these questions, you ask them in a certain way. Let's have a look. So why don't we try? I've got some of the prompts here. But why don't we try that first one? Weaning instructions for citalopram, let's say. Okay. I'm just going to paste this, but I'll just read it out. It says, give a patient a detailed written instruction for weaning off a daily dose of citalopram, 40 milligrams, explaining which tablets to take. Okay. So let's see what happens. So I might read out a few of these bits, but I'll leave everyone else to see. But what it's doing is it's predicting what the next word is the best fit to this. So you can see it says, here's some detailed written instructions for weaning off a daily dose of citalopram, 40 milligrams. And it's a bulleted list. And it starts with, discuss your plan to wean off citalopram with your healthcare provider. Very important. They'll be able to advise you on the best plan for your specific situation and monitor your progress during the weaning process. And then begin by reducing your daily dose of citalopram by 10 milligrams. If you're taking 40 milligrams per day, reduce it by th to 30 milligrams a day and take it for one week. Explains about side effects continue to reduce, then halving the reduction, and then finally wean off completely. And then go slowly, minimize the risk of side effects. And you know what's really interesting here? I ran this to test this earlier on. It's actually giving a slightly different answer here. Equally comprehensive, but different. This is not preformed text. Yeah. So I'm just going to pause there and say, you know, looking at that, that looks pretty solid to me. What do you think? So it's very detailed. Um, I think there's probably some parts, if I was giving that to a patient, I may want to edit it slightly just to make it a little bit shorter um, mm -hmm. because I'm aware that some of our patients may not want that level of detail. But then at the same time, actually having that as a reference to those who do want the detail and all the information, I mean, you've generated that in about 20 seconds. Yeah. You know, for me to preform, think and write that, you're talking a good 10 minutes, I would say, minimum, if not longer, to be honest, to, Absolutely. to do that. And people often talk about using template letters as well. And of course, they've got an absolute role to play. But then when you think about the huge variety of things we do, and you did that brilliant infographic of the iceberg, you know, about mm -hmm. all the different things you do, for you to have access to all the templates that you need for everything would take a long time to do and maintain yeah. as well. So products like this or services like this actually could be really helpful to just very quickly get to that point. OK, but then you said, like, could we make it shorter and simpler? Well, why don't we ask it to do that? Simplified it. 
Um, yeah. So talk to your healthcare prov provider about to wean off. Reduce your dose by dose 20 milligrams per day, 10 milligrams a day uh, every week until 20 milligrams. And then, yeah, gradually go down to five and reduce from there. So, yeah. And again, yeah. at this point, like I did earlier on, I could say, can we have this in French, Italian, <laughs> whatever language? Do it in the voice of Yoda. Do it as a poem. I mean, that's not going to be helpful to a patient. But no. you can see how very quickly you can tune this and then... At the, when the time is right, cut and paste, edit it and put it across. So that would save me a lot of time. I remember on patients when I was, um, it wasn't so much weaning of this, but it was making dose adjustments on opiates and so on, you know, yeah. sometimes quite complex. This this could be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, things like particularly the gabapentinoids, which, you know, the daily dosing can vary. Going through that with a patient, you're, talk, you're right, that, that that's a good, you know, five to 10 minutes minimum. If even in brief, you know, and that's not probably doing it as well as we would like to do, but obviously time allows us to do what we can and stuff. So, and we know that compliance with medications and stuff is so much better when patients have correct information and detailed information rather than the quick, short, do what we can kind of option, which unfortunately many of us are having to deal with because of the capacity and challenges we're dealing with. Yeah. So that's weaning medications. Okay. I'm sure there's other uses and stuff. What else can we have a look at? Well, let's have a look here. Uh, one of the ones that I'd quite like to do is, um, so again, speaking about patients, is uh, simplifying radiology reports. And this is something that I are actually, or, you know, come close to actually using with my patients because it's so effective. Now, it's really important to say, and we'll come back to the limitations uh, yeah. uh, a little uh, later on, is um, it's doing an impression, basically, of what it is. It's used, it's got a lot of training data, but one of the problems that can happen is that it can get incorrect information in here. So right now, it's really important when you look at this that you may see some errors or what they call hallucinations in there as well. So this is part of the reason that it's not fit to just turn on and put out mm -hmm. there. This will be developed further. Anyway, let's go back to this. So um, what I've got here is I went onto the internet and I uh, found a sample uh, CT scan with contrast. Um, and... Uh, uh, I'll post it into here in a second. So why don't I say, so I'm going to say, create a patient-friendly summary of the following uh, report. I'm pasting it here. Now, there's a lot to it. I'm just going to scroll up. You can see. Wow. You know, okay. it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a complicated one here. And, and I'll just pause for a moment. You can see multi-axial CT, evidence of diffuse hepatic hypoattenuation compatible with fatty infiltration. It goes on like this for a little bit, right? Okay. okay. All right, yeah. anyway, patient, you know, you and I will have done this with patients many times, you know, simplifying yeah. it and so on. All right, what does uh, OpenAI do? Here we go. So, there. Can you see that? I can. Can you read it out for us? If yeah, I'll right. read it out. And, uh, there's, someone, there's someone cleaning my windows outside. So if you hear a bit of noise, that's what it is. Okay. So it's, it summarizes that the patient has a mild case of inflammation in their small intestine, a condition, a condition called enteritis. They also have a condition called fatty liver, where there's an excess of fat in the liver. They previously had their gallbladder removed, a surgery called a cholecystectomy. And it goes on. Okay. And so sort of summarized all of this. Even says things, the patient's kidneys, pancreas, spleen, and uterus and ovaries, all normal. Now... Mm -hmm. So you can look at that and um, you would want to go back and double check that everything is in place there. Yeah. But from what I did when I did this earlier on, it captured the majority of this. Again, this is not ready for prime time right now, but it mm -hmm. gives you an indication of what might happen. And more importantly, so imagine I'm a patient who has this access and I say, I have it and say, please explain this. And it comes up with this. And I'm like, well, what is enteritis? And it explains it. So not only can you go through this with the patient and get a summary, but the patient mm -hmm. in their own time, when this is ready, can query this in the way that they want. The model can act in loco medicus, in, you know, in your place uh, for this. Now, again, there's work needed to get this done, but this gives you an yeah. insight into how this might be used in future and a much more dynamic conversation between doctor patient and ai to give a really really like comprehensive and holistic solution 
and I guess, you know, in my head as a trainer as well, GP trainer, looking at this, you know, I can see this as a, a, absolutely a learning tool to help our GP trainees understand how to give information in a more patient friendly way. Mm -hmm. You know, we have got obviously a, a significant increase in the number of international medical graduates who, where language is, is a challenge and actually simplifying complex stuff into more simpler things is, is one of the really big skills for general practice, to be honest. If you can do that right, your patients will understand the information and again, compliance is better. And this, wow. I can definitely see that being a tool to help you do that. It's it, yeah. you're, you're right. It's not the fix on its own. It's the tool to help you do that, isn't it? Exactly right. Yeah. And this is, you know, and again, you can imagine like I'll, there'll be some people watch this thinking, yeah, but all that ability to simplify things is hard won knowledge that I can now mm. rely on, you know, and it's a little bit like any kind of automations. I suppose it's like GPS and map reading. You know, as a kid, mm. I had to sit in the front with my dad and read a map and now everyone uses GPS. Um, their ability to read maps is diminished as well. So mm -hmm. pros and cons in this one too. But again, think of the patient, think of their needs. Yeah. Let's not let our limitations prevent the patients getting the information they want. And plus the other way I'd look at it is this gives you the information in terms of the condition and, and that kind of stuff to help you provide it in a different format that may be easier for patients to engage with. Mm -hmm. In terms of the individual interpretation for that patient, actually that's where you still need the clinician to apply that particular instance of using this as a tool to give that information and then personalize it specifically to the patient in front of you. And that's something that ChatGPT won't be able to do because it won't have that context. And more importantly, it won't have that emotion. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, yes. And the emotional, like, I love my tech too. I sometimes mm -hmm. get swept up in all of this as well, but the importance of an emotional input into decision and explanation and that final layer of continuity care, that relationship, that that bit of magic that allows what you do to make mm -hmm. a difference to a patient is eternally going to be there. Um, but I don't know, maybe chat GPT-5 will do that too. Who knows? But it's very, very important to have it in there too. The other thing to say as well is that remember that we're talking about tools and this does a great job of like predicting from pre-trained data. Some of these big models can be trained for smaller models that work in very specific situations. So you okay. can imagine this being done on the corpus of system one or EMIS data, for example, and providing mm -hmm. information that's much more attuned to that area or scientific uh, okay. information in the background. So, and it's one tool. So you're saying, well, what's the other information? So if I had time, I could say write a letter with this, but also bear in mind that the patient has X, Y, and Z. If you mm -hmm. had like a smart search creating the additional data, which was plugged into this, you might then get a much more kind of nuanced summary here. But this is potentially where it might go. So that's future. Before we jump to the future, let's have a look at the present. Um, so I know that you wanted to talk about um, how this can be used in terms of summarizing information in particular. Can you walk sure. us through that? Yeah, sure. So uh, again, what I've got here right now is uh, thanks to uh, Dave Trisco, who's also a wonderful techie GP out yep. there on the internet and on Twitter. And uh, he, this was actually his uh, example. He mocked up using, I believe it's Flores in AccuRx. Uh, you can get uh, structured information for patients yep. before they come in. And so I'm used to all of that. And I'm, you know, I'm a big fan in getting this information in, in, in place. Uh, I've just got to find that data. I'm just going to quickly see if I can find the message from Dave. Here it is. Whoop copy that out and come back. Hopefully, there you go. So what I've done is this is uh, um, simulated data uh, mm -hmm. here right now. And within this, uh, what it shows is it will show um, uh, uh, some of the information that you get back from a Flory. So what I'm going to write here is I'm going to write, uh, write a summary of the following information. Okay. Now I'll paste this. Oh, hang on, it's going to ask. I didn't give the information. I'll do it here. Okay, so I'll just put, uh, summarize this. Okay, so you can see here, it's a low back pain questionnaire. And then you can see the kind of the, this is all very valuable information, but I would argue this is not very human friendly. You know, yeah. it's, it's, you know it's broken down uh, two weeks, seven, no back pain, lots of yeses and nos. And, you know, with NHS 111, you'll sometimes get the, you know, patient reports, no history of back pain equals no. Yeah. And the double negatives, yeah. So what I want is I want a uh, registrar or someone to be like on my ward round and say, ah, Dr. Grimes, you know, and give me a nice little summary. Well, can chat GPT do that? Let's find Let's out. Yeah. Taking a moment here. 
Now, hopefully it'll work. If it doesn't, we'll try again in a minute. I'm thinking. This is maybe one of the bits that you might cut out. There we go. Oh, there we go. So I think that is easier to read. Um, mm -hmm. I would take a moment, you know, and double check and make sure that all the information's in there as well. But you can see here, you know, pain remains when lying down, yes. Pain disturbs sleep, yes, is converted to the pain remains when the patient lies down and disrupts their sleep. So same information, but I would say that this is kind of more digestible. And um, you can see how pre-captured information could be summarized in this way, and it would make my job easier. So when I see the patient, it just shaves that little bit of time and a little bit of cognitive effort off yeah. me, which means I can be more able to help the person when I see them. So like you said before, it's putting information in, it processes in, and it churns it in a way that is different. And like you said, this, for many people, I think would be far more digestible um, than just a list of positives, negatives, and that kind of stuff, which, you know, for some people that's going to work, for some people it's not going to work and they're going to struggle and find that overwhelming, to be honest, mm -hmm. at times. And, and this can just provide that information in a different way that makes it more processable. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's all about... It's all about helping the healthcare professional meet the needs of the patient in this particular example or, or whatever it is that you do. Now, uh, before we move on from this, this is an interesting thing. And I haven't tried this yet, so let's see what happens. Um, let's go for it. Is ChatGP able to tell me what's, you know, what is the likely diagnosis? Okay, this is the bit well, where we all... Scary base. This is the bit where we all wonder and go, oh my God, when I press enter, is this the end of my career? Let's have a look here. Is this the future of healthcare? I don't know if it does it or not, but we'll have a watch and see. Now, again, I'm showing you this. It's not intended for using this. Do not do this uh, in the real world. But let's. It's it's an interesting thing. What it's what it will be doing is it'll be um, this network. Oh, here you go. Difficult to provide a specific diagnosis based on the limited information provided. That in and of itself is mm -hmm. great because it's recognizing that we haven't got enough information right there to yep. see this person. Um, and then it goes into some of the lower back pain uh, causes, including muscle sprains, spinal abnormalities, and underlying medical conditions. In order to accurately diagnose the cause of it, necessary to obtain more information about the history, perform a physical examination, and potentially order diagnostic tests such as imaging studies or lab tests. And they importantly seek medical attention in order to determine the cause of the pain. I think that's pretty good. It's not gone beyond the bounds of what it's able to do. If you spend some time online looking at ChatGPT, there are ways to you to force it to give you an opinion and so on. But I'll leave that mm -hmm. for you to find out afterwards. But there you go. Job safe for now, I think. Definitely. At least it wasn't telling us lots and lots of scary things like Google would typically do. Because obviously Google presents you the information you want to see. And what most people want to see when they've got a health issue is they want to know it's not the worst thing in the world. So what it presents obviously is the worst thing in the world. Um, and that's why often I know some people really struggle managing um, cyberchondria and other aspects of health because of the way that current search engines do. This, I would say, is a more measured approach. Sure, sure. Yeah. And it might be, it'll be really interesting to see how technologies like this get taken by companies, the NHS, yeah. working people like me. You know, this is the sort of thing that I work on to try and take this exciting technology and think, well, actually, no, it's not about the tech. What mm -hmm. it's about is about what are the pro what are the real problems for the patients? What are the real problems for the doctors and the nurses? Um, and what can we solve it? And it, this could be a great thing. Maybe it doesn't need something as fancy as this. Sometimes a simpler solution is necessary. Maybe. But so time we will go on. About we'll solving, we talked about solving problems. So I know the reason that I actually contacted you about this was some of the other demonstrations that you're doing with this particularly. And this was about responding to hospital. <laughs> yes, yes. That I was know funny. we wanted yeah. to show this. Shall we show what this can Why really I mean, do? And, yeah. And, and th this was the thing that said to me, I need to speak to Keith about this. So, so let's have a look at it. <laughs> Saving the best to last. Twitter, if you're interested in clinical product, Twitter is one of the most wonderful things on earth because while doctors spend a lot of their time complaining about how awful things are and things can be pretty awful, it's a really rich source of problems <coughs> that you can try and solve. And in this case, the wonderful parody RCGP, who I follow and would encourage everyone to follow as well, 
was uh, putting across some of their, you know, um, characteristically forthright views uh, mm -hmm. on uh, things that feel like they're being dumped back the way. And um, everyone's under pressure, of course. So yeah. um, we still want to sort of help the patient out. And But, you know, it can take a lot of time to respond to these things. And we may have template letters, uh, but let's see what ChatGPT does on this one here. So again, I don't have this preformed, but uh, what we had here from the tweet was that this was a patient with CLL, discharge from hematology, annual blood count at GP, if any concern with lymphocytosis or lymphadenopathy, please rediscuss. You know, that's, you know, handing a lot of things back on to a GP. Should they be doing all this? There's not much information mm -hmm. for the patient. So why don't we see what chat GPT does here as well? Okay, so there's two ways of doing it. Number one is like, shall we, as GPs say, can we see a letter and see if we can hand this care back? I'm not saying whether that's appropriate or not here, but let's see this. Okay, yep. so write a professional, oops, professional and polite letter to a hospital hematologist uh, who has us put inappropriately okay um you know that may not be the case here inappropriately uh, discharged a patient to gp care for ongoing monitoring yeah that seems all right yep let's see what happens because I asked it to be professional, polite, it's struggling to find a way to do that. <laughs> um, what this has done, when I've done this before, and it may take a moment because this is a very popular system right now, um, is it will put in, oh, here you go. It's, uh, it's started formatting and you can see it's got like form field spaces. So, mm -hmm. oh, here you go. Expressing my concern. It's really going in quite heavy at this point, isn't it? <laughs> wow. But still, polite, professional. Yeah, no, I respectfully um, request, you know, so, so it is keeping some of the terms in there, you know, in the semantics. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Since we're amongst friends, let's see what happens if we say, well, why don't we do this again, but make it a little bit more grumpy? So uh, <laughs> yeah. rewrite this, but but be more grumpy and irritated. Okay, let's see what happens. <laughs> Please Again, I'm not recommending you do this, but, but I suppose what this does is this helps illustrate the fact that it's not just, this isn't regurgitating information. This is mm -hmm. looking at the entire corpus of information that's on the internet and all these different examples. Oh, here you go. Oh, there you go. Wow. So kind of spiced it up a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. outrageous. Yeah. All right. Okay. Again, you might not want to lead with something like this, but no. I suppose in the privacy of your own room, when you're feeling frustrated, you might feel some of that anger dissipates when uh, the AI vents your frustrations for you. And maybe this is possibly one of those ways of venting your frustrations seeing it and then actually realizing that actually I probably need to go for a slightly more measured approach because actually while sometimes it can feel cathartic to unleash what your frustrations when you particularly when you're doing this possibly late at night because you're still there actually often sleeping on these kind of things is far more effective and actually having a productive route of doing this can be more effective in the longer term and in the shorter term okay. so actually I, I, I quite like that first one because it gives you a template structure to look at in terms of saying actually I don't think this is appropriate Here's what we're going to do potentially to look at fixing the discrepancy in terms of what we think is, is you know, our different views of how this needs to work. Um, and it's definitely a more polite and measured approach to the second one, which I would definitely not recommend sending in any way. Shape, or form. <laughs> Absolutely not. And of course, just one thing I was going to say as well, and we'll come on to it maybe in a moment, is that um, in, these, in this situation, um, remember you're submitting information to a secure site, but you should not be sending any patient identifiable information. Absolutely. Or, you know, any of this, like I encourage you to explore with synthetic information and made up cases and so on, but this is not a secure environment to be doing that. Sure. So you talked a few times about the fact that obviously we're not recommending people go out and start doing this today. But what about tomorrow? What's coming? Okay. So what's coming down the line here? Well, I mean, the first thing is that um, there's been quite a stir this year about the use of either generative AI, and that's to do with AI art, which you may have seen online, where you just type a description, it will create novel pieces of artwork, mm -hmm. images, and this. So the 
it's been a long time coming, but these large language models and generative models are now finding a way to be really quite useful uh, in the real world. So I think what you'll probably find happening next is that there'll be a lot of people in different industries looking at this and thinking, well, how can I use this in X, Y, or Z? And of course, here I am, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm working in health tech. I'm thinking, well, how, how could this be useful? And we've discussed some of the ways there. So I think what will happen is that you're going to start seeing more people talking online, startups implementing this and deploying it um, uh, in maybe some sort of narrow areas, you know, like potentially the handling of documentation is a really good example. You know, mm -hmm. I think people at Docman, isn't it, that's used and there'll be yep. some automated coding of that. So you'll probably see some substantial improvements in things like, I don't know if Docman are using this, but that kind of technology. So it becomes better and better and more reliable at actually extracting the codes that you need or formulating responses and so on. I think that will happen first up. For these to actually be used as an intended uh, intended in healthcare space, you've got to do quite a lot of things. You've got to make sure that it's safe to be used as a clinical safety aspect. Use of technology this way might consider a regulated medical device, and then you have to comply with UK, EU, or international regulation. There's the privacy aspect. We just covered that a little bit earlier on and cybersecurity too. And that's just on this. Then it has to interoperate with your own electronic, you know, your system, EMIS, system one, whatever other system you use too. So there's plenty of work that needs to happen, but the technology is moving so fast and the promise is so great that I think you'll actually start seeing this happen a little bit more quickly. One of the areas that I think might be interesting is that I know that there's going to be the withdrawal of some of the Q-risk codes and other like medical calculations from GP yeah. systems coming up. I think that's going to leave a bit of a gap um, in uh, what's needed for doctors and the st their staff. So I think there's some opportunities coming up in the next year or so where you're going to start seeing um, more technology coming in about. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a wee bit of work that needs to happen first. Um, and that's why it's really important for end users, doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals, interested people to understand about the technology. And for those that have a real interest in it to be involved in the actual building and testing of it. That's my kind of call to action is that people engage with this because these are tools to help us. Um, they're not there to replace us. God mm -hmm. needs some help <laughs> uh, in terms of staffing, not only here, but around the world. So yeah. I, I get very excited about that, that we're able to get back to providing the care that we all want to. Absolutely. And I think, you know, what I've definitely seen from the demonstrations you've done online and particularly this, I think there are so many use cases that we could use. Like you say, you have to be cautious about um, obviously the generation of the information to make sure it's appropriate and safe to use. And also, as you mentioned, you know, recognize you can't use patient identifiable information on here. It's definitely not appropriate in that situation yeah. and things. But it could help to provide those templates and those guidance for you to how to create the the, the information you need in order to manage uh, your patients, you know, support information delivery, you know, things like social media posts about some of the challenges you're facing. I could, I could definitely see we're short staff today. We want to make sure patients are safe. What's the output from that? And you, rather than having to sit there and think, which I often end up doing when, when we've had challenges like that, you know, you've got it in a few seconds and then that's just taking some of that cognitive load away from you. That means that actually that will hopefully be more effective and stuff. So I can definitely see some use cases for general practice currently, but as you quite rightly mentioned, patient information, all that kind of stuff that has to be factored in. Could that be the future? Well, that will require somebody to develop that. And the speed of change that we're seeing with this kind of stuff is pretty quick. Yeah. So I don't think it'd be too long, like you said, in terms of us seeing something that helps with this side of stuff. Oh, absolutely. It's, it, it, you know, I like to think of it as um, this is the kind of cavalry, like help is coming. You know, I think um, one of the wonderful things about working in health tech um, is that you have the opportunity to really, really properly solve the problems that are in front of people. And the problems that are in front of doctors and nurses and patients is not always the problem that's seen by people in industry and the commercial sector yeah. as well, you know, which is why it's so important that our voices are heard in there and we represent properly Definitely. too. And the patients are involved as well uh, and everyone else involved in healthcare. Because if we can get that match right and, and really understand the problems as well as understanding the strengths and limitations of these tools, then we can start doing some, some great things. Then we can start like delivering the care that we want to, to everyone and mm -hmm. not like, frantically sort of coping with what's happening right now. Awesome. So you mentioned that this is something that obviously you're looking at in your new 
world and, and your new time and stuff. If people wanted to contact you, where where's the best place for them to do that? Keith? Yeah, sure. So um, as I start looking on what's happening next, I certainly work in the world of sort of digital health consultancy and clinical product management. Uh, I'm the best way to get in touch with me is I'm an inveterate at Twitter. So if you want to go into Twitter, as long as it still exists, uh, it's at Keith Grimes. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to hear from you. If you've got any comments about what I've said, and if you think there's areas that I've missed, particularly bits that you're more concerned about or bits that you think I've misrepresented, just say, like, I'm really happy to hear from you. Equally, I love hearing about problems that people are having um, mm -hmm. so I can think about solutions. And then in sort of more professional capacity, I'm also on LinkedIn as well under Dr. Keith Grimes. Um, and uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll send a link on to you and it can go maybe in show yeah. notes. But uh, there's lots of other things coming down the way. I do quite a lot of talks, presentations, and blog posts and the like. So but if you start with those two places, you'll get in touch and I'll be delighted to hear from you. Absolutely. And if people do want to check out all those links that Keith mentioned, so do have a look down below, it'll be in the description and stuff. So if you click on the little more button, um, that'll give you all the links to the chat GPT websites, you know, the contacts for Keith and, and stuff, and also some of those posts that you saw as well to have a look at what you can do. And I think that's our message. Have a look at this. It's really easy to start doing, quick to do, and actually you may find that this helps you in ways that you don't even realize. And as Keith mentioned, you know, these are ideas and, and options that people have come up with in about two, three weeks since it started. Imagine what can happen with a bit more time. I think mm -hmm. that's something really special potentially that we can see. Thank you, Keith. I've really enjoyed the session. Um, I, I've been geeking out throughout the whole thing. So I've, at the very least, I've enjoyed it. I'm hoping our EGP learners have, have found this useful, informative and enjoyable. Um, and absolutely, if people do want to contact us, let us know. And if you want to check out more information, I'm sure there's going to be content coming up right about here somewhere that's telling you to have a look at it and stuff. And as always, we're here to help tech enhance your primary care and learning. We'll catch you in the next episode. Great speaking to you all. Take care, everyone.